Um, so thank you for joining us today. Um, obviously, as property managers, we're really well tuned in to all things that have been going on in the industry, um, especially working with a lot of owners. Um, and so I wanted to jump into this presentation regarding licensing and disclosures. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I've got James Rice with me, one of my our longtime leasing agents, heads of the department. And I'm going to get into some of his credentials in terms of what he sees and how often he's been doing it. Um, and so this conversation, I'm going to try to do it relatively quick, but hit on some of the big stuff because I wanted to keep it short and sweet and, and max it out at an hour. Um, and so our agenda is going to be mostly about the business licensing and the inspection consents, along with some application requirements, uh, the, the required application disclosures, tenant bill of rights, um, and some of those application fees that we're going to talk about at the tail end. It's not about pricing, um, unit prep, marketing, uh, showings, or tenant qualifications. Those things can all be talked about in, in another webinar. Um, but I do recognize that lots of agents have begun um, working with owners um, and a lot of owners are beginning to do it themselves. And so this is really going to be focusing on making sure that everybody has the appropriate um, paperwork, uh, knows which agencies are involved and, uh, and is able to navigate this pr process um, pretty easily. Now, as far as the uh, introduction, uh, James and I have worked together for over nine years. Um, we've worked with over 1,300 owners, managed over 1,400 properties. We've leased well over 2,000 units um, in which we receive literally over 27,000 inquiries um, over that span of time, um, processed well over 5,000 applications, and drafted over 2,700 leases. So we definitely have had the experience in doing this. Um, James has done the majority of it in that time. Um, and so there will certainly be parts of this presentation that I'm gonna have him expand upon uh, just in terms of that visibility um, and, uh, and what we found to be best practices. Now, um, I'll kick it off with the front end stuff, basic business licensing and the inspection consent. So, we all know that DC has a licensing requirement for rental properties, um, or at least I thought we all knew. Uh, this Every time I have a conversation with an agent, I learn something new. Um, all owners are not necessarily well-versed in the idea that you have to have a license to operate a business in the district. Uh, and so we stress that that needs to be attended to more timely um, than most other aspects of renting, just because the process does take a while. Um, we've gone through this with hundreds of owners um, and just navigating the application, inspection, paperwork process, which is multi-leveled, um, does require a lot of patience and a fair amount of time. Um, and so some of the things that we found have helped with that um, is first making sure that they are aware of this requirement. Um, not everybody is. Uh, and so you really don't want to put the cart ahead of the horse in terms of making sure that you get the proper licensing because it does come up. It's a section of the lease. There's going to be other paperwork that James is going to show later that draws attention to the fact that the property needs to be licensed. And so um, we've broken this down into the most common three. Um, you're likely going to be working on either a one family rental, which is essentially the one unit that's going to be leased out by one individual um, or more. But realistically, it's one door um, and, and, and that's all there is to it. The two family rentals are going to be maybe like the the uh, the um, by, uh, duplexes or the uh, converted row houses with the basement apartment. Um, these are ones where you're going to need to make sure that there's two separate units, two separate leases likely. Um, you essentially have to go outdoors to go back in. Um, oh, those are going to be the two family rentals. And then, of course, anything larger than that falls into the ap apartment category, and, and that's priced based off of um, size and door count. Um, but getting started on this paperwork, um, getting that licensing in advance of any additional efforts is definitely recommended and something that we 
uh, prompt and suggest to all of our owners to get going on it as soon as you consider the idea of, of renting out that property, because it certainly will take a lot longer than leasing, um, likely take a lot longer than a lot of the other efforts, um, preparation of the property, getting it ready for, for those tenants, and of course, getting a, a tenant in. Uh, and so, be mindful of that, share it out. Um, there is a lot that goes into these um checklists making sure that um the property is going to be in compliance is an easy thing for you to do walk through the property use this checklist that dc has available um i would say that uh, if all of this has been met 95 percent of the properties will pass on the first attempt um, but they keep throwing changes to us and it's um tough to know what that inspector is going to see at that date and time um, and we definitely, definitely recommend trying to get those DC inspections done before a property is occupied by a resident. Um, we've definitely seen some issues with owners occupying it um, and some things just not being found to be in, um, utilized appropriately. Uh, and we definitely will see that on the back end after tenants have taken possession. Um, now, if it's not obtained prior to the tenants taking possession, it's not the end of the world. Um, we have been putting the inspection consent form in with our leases uh, for a good amount of time now. That way, if there is residual inspections, additional work that needs to get done, we kind of have that pre-authorization. Uh, James, you put this in almost every lease that you send out. Um, yeah. Have you ever had any issues? No, no. I mean, just like you said, I, I would highly recommend if you are, you know, drafting a lease for, for a client or, or, you know, for yourself, um, I would definitely recommend putting this in here just um, because you already have the tenant's consent. You don't need to to get it. And, you know, it it kind of is isn't questioned really on, on the front end when when the lease is sent out. Um, so that that is definitely something I, I would recommend putting in there along with, you know, all the other disclosures that we're going to get to eventually here. Yeah, and um, not having this in can become semi-problematic. Um, it's just a lot of extra work because uh, it's hard to necessarily see when DC is going to A, get it on the calendar, um, B, they will threaten uh, thousands of dollars worth of fines if you're unable to get in on those dates. Uh, and if the tenant isn't home and present to provide that access, they need some proof that there's authorization to enter. Um, and so one of the things that we have done, um, it, because it could be a little open ended, is uh, not necessarily put the date on it uh, until you, you know when they're going to go. Um, obviously, there are going to be notification requirements and you want to make sure that the unit will, in fact, pass. Um, so you may want to pit stop in prior to just to make sure before DC comes out um, because they do threaten thousand dollar fines um, and just for missing an appointment. Uh, and so I would it, say, yeah. I would say, like you said, Carmen, it does take a little bit of time. I mean, on average, it's, you know, it could take a month and a half, two months to get a BBL, right? Um, that, that's kind of what we're seeing um, with DC getting in there to do the inspection. So, you know, ultimately you want to have the BBL done prior to a tenant occupying the property. But if the tenant's already in there, you know, you already want to have this done just to try to progress the process as smooth as possible because it can be a challenge. So. Yeah. And we're not going to be all doom and gloom. I mean, there are yeah. ways that you can expedite the process. Uh, yeah. We generally don't see it. Um, I'd like to be prepared for the uh, worst, but obviously hope for the best um, because we have these calls all the time with clients that want it rented tomorrow, but haven't even started the process, right? Um, everything is, is a process and it does take time. And so this is one that we have found is very easy to begin working on much earlier in the re the um, planning process. And once it's done, it's set. You can get licenses for two years or four years for that initial period. Um, they do have to inspect. They do need to make sure it's in good order. And so if, it, if there is an intention to get it rented, it's worth doing. Um, the fees to the district are $198.30. Uh, so even if it's a maybe, maybe not, um, I'd still say might as well just get it because you can always cancel the license. Um, unfortunately, getting the money back from DC is is a different conversation altogether. Um, so it is easy to work with because there are a lot of agencies that are involved in these this uh, uh, renting out properties in the district. Um, DHCD obviously is is over uh, seeing the licensing process. Um, the rental accommodations division is another one that 
goes along with it. Um, but I would say that um, I'll get into a couple of these other documents shortly with James. But um, you know, GCAR and DCAR provide guidance to realtors in terms of um, some of the paperwork. But not everything is going to be up to date and 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 updated timely. It's um, worth making sure that all of the documents that I'm going to show and James is going to expand upon shortly are covered um, and up to date, and that you're using the most relevant. Um, you know, keeping up with the uh, uh, lease updates as well as the disclosure updates. Um, but there's a, a couple of different agencies that are involved um, that, uh, you know, it's worth tracking and being aware of because um, we'll get into the um, Tenant Bill of Rights uh, momentarily with the Office of Tenant Advocate. Um, we'll show you more on the um, licensing um, and, of course, the OEE, the Department of Energy and, uh, and the Environment, and not only sees lead, um, but a handful of other things that could become um, uh, part of the rental process for you. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to James to talk about the housing providers disclosure, and we'll go from there. Yeah, just real brief on the, on the last slide. Um, we we did share, you know, a couple of um, agencies there. I mean, ultimately, you know, we, we obviously work with a lot of landlords, right? Being a property management company, so we want to try to protect our owners as much as possible, given the fact that DC is a very tenant friendly jurisdiction. Um, so I would highly recommend, um, you know, you guys to to look into. Um, uh, you, utilizing GCAR, um, the lease agreement, because it is the most, um, it offers the most protections for landlords, uh, although, you know, ultimately tenant, you know, tenants have uh, a lot of rights in DC. So I did want to um, just emphasize that before getting into to the disclosure. So this disclosure that uh, Conrad is showing here, the housing um, providers disclosure, it, it goes um, hand in hand with the uh, basic business license. So um, as Conrad mentioned, you, you have to uh, notify the, the renter that you're you know, renting the property to um, what the basic business license number is, the rent control exemption number if the property is not subject to rent control. And then there's a few other points um, in this paperwork that you need to fill out. Um, depending on what the property is or what the tenant is, if they have housing assistance or, um, you know, their voucher or, or things of that nature, um, there may be some additional information that needs to be checked off or included in this paperwork. Um, but not always th does this need to be filled out in full. But, you know, the, the basic information, the, the, the owner's name, the address, property information, um, uh, the, the basic business license, rent control exemption number, things of that nature um, need to be included along with the application fee, which we'll touch on uh, later on, and, and the security deposit. Um, also, one, one thing that has changed, this document was updated in 2021. Um, residents uh, will may request um, the history, the rent history for the property that you're currently renting to them. Uh, of course, if this is a first time rental, you don't have any history. You just need to notify the residents of that. Um, but keep in mind that, you know, residents may ask and, you know, you will need to disclose what the rental prices were previously prior to, to this resident, um, you know, um, off getting offered the property and signing a lease agreement. So, um, that is the first document that we send out along with Conrad. Uh, and uh, we did yep. put in the um, the name of the form just so you can review. And of course, that uh, could be subject to change, um, but you want to make sure you're using the most up to date on all of these. Yep. Yep. And so the way we um, structure it, we, we want to send out the application <laughs> disclosure packet and the tenant bill of rights uh, at the same time. Uh, these two documents should be sent out prior to a lease being executed. Um, and the tenant bill of rights is, you know, what what it seems like, right? I mean, you know, we have the bill of rights in the United States, right? These are what is listed, what needs to be in, a part of any lease agreement. These are the basic fundamental rights that tenants have in DC. Um, I, I do want to state that 
some of the things in the tenant bill of rights can seem to conflict what's listed in the lease agreement that GCAR provides. But I, I feel as if, you know, if that is the case, it's, it's, you know, the tenant has the, the right to, to some things and so does the landlord. So it, it's kind of both parties working in unison to make sure that, um, you know, um, for example, uh, pest controls, I, I believe, is listed on here. You know, the, the, the property needs to be free and clear of pests uh, and the landlord needs to be, um, you know, notified if there are any pest control issues. So things of that nature that you want to, you know, keep an eye on. Um, the other things listed, I don't, I don't need to go through each and every one of them, but, you know, the tenant has the right to a written lease agreement, the security deposit. Um, don't be equal to one month's rent um, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, in order for the um, in order for the the tenant to have this lease agreement, they need to include the, the tenant bill of rights on here and they need to they need to sign and they need to date it. So you just want to make sure um, that that is included in the lease agreement. Um, the final disclosure we want to discuss is the lead paint um, disclosure. So this was updated in 2020. Um, so some of you may know that there was a disclosure before this, which only referenced um, housing before 1978 when it pertains to um, lead paint in the household. Um, so before it, it was only including that. And then since this update took place in 2020, there has been an emphasis on including the um, uh, lead piping um, in the District of Columbia for housing before 1986. So um, this is something that the the owner, the landlord, would be required to fill out. Um, there is a website that they can go to to see if there is any issues with lead pipe uh, lead piping in DC um, and. You know, you want to make sure that this is sent out for any and all properties in D.C. that was built before 1986, not just 1978. So I, I want I want to make sure that that is, um, you know, stated because I, I think a lot of people have the understanding. Well, it's, you know, built after 1978. I don't have to worry about this. The other thing is this is a different disclosure than the sales disclosure that um, they have for lead paint. Um, so, you know, I would familiarize yourself with this, you know, uh, and obviously have this included in any uh, lease that um, pertains to a property before, you know, 1986. Mm -hmm. The only other thing I do want to touch on is the lead paint requirements. If you are renting to residents, uh, a woman that may be pregnant or is pregnant or a child that's living in the property uh, under the age of six, you are obligated to um, um, test the property for lead. Um, and we would highly recommend you get that test done prior to, to any uh, resident occupying the property. So some things to keep in mind um, when, when it comes to lead and disclosures in D.C. Yeah, and uh, I'll add to that. Not only is it recommended to do before they well before they take possession, well before, um, but you don't know what you're going to be getting in terms of an applicant. And so um, and you don't know what you might um, have issues with. And so I would recommend having that testing done well in advance, kind of running parallel to the licensing, uh, because Why you don't know what work's going to get done. And it would not be fun to go and do a full turnover on a property just to find out that there's additional work and you have to kind of um, do or, uh, or redo uh, something that you've already done. Um, just just from a planning pers um, perspective, it, it's if you think there's a likelihood, um, you want to do it. And of course, you don't necessarily have the opportunity to ask um, if somebody's going to be pregnant or has children or all those other questions. So um, you do want to make sure that you're you're covering. Um, and and for the inspection costs, um, I think we can do uh, larger homes for like under five hundred dollars just for the testing, and and that gives you that additional insurance. Um, and they're good. Um, both Montgomery County and DC has these requirements, and so it's something to uh, consider on the front end um, in terms of a uh, preparation for leasing out the property. And it's a good point, Conrad, that you bring up. I mean, DC won't allow you to get a BBL if there's flaking and peeling paint everywhere, right? Yeah. So, and and that's something that can come up in properties that are built before 1978. So, you know, they go hand in hand. 
And like, like we said, we would recommend that to get done, uh, you know, as soon as possible um, prior to anybody taking occupancy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the next part is just a couple of FYIs um, that uh, I have um, talked to lots of people over the course of a, the last handful of years. And, um, and not all of the information that DC tries to share out um, is a, easy to found, find or has been shared effectively. Um, and so a couple of years ago, um, we were always able to work off of the basis that you can do reasonable notice, um, reasonable purpose for entering. Um, you know, there was a little leeway in terms of what reasonable meant. And a handful of years ago, uh, they went ahead and kind of more defined it. And so as far as it goes, entering the property after a tenant is in possession, um, you need to give at least 48 hours written notice in the absence of the tenant's agreement otherwise. And I wrote that out because that is some the way that it's written. Um, and so if you were to talk to them and they say, sure, no problem, I mean, you'll you'll have some exceptions to the rule, um, especially if there is an emergency that needs to be attended to right away. Like it, it can't wait. It's not like you can give 20, uh, 48 hours to deal with a, a backed up basement. But um, given at least 48 hours written notice, um, is what they're expecting. Um, and then, of course, they want that to be done at reasonable times. So nine to five, Monday through Friday. Um, there are allowances on Saturday, but um, you should be getting um, specific permission in writing, ideally, from the tenant on uh, for Sundays and, and, and federal holidays. Um, but there are those allowances that they give you in terms of just saying, sure, no problem. Um, but I would try to keep it in writing just in case, especially if you do have a more um, challenging resident. Um, and then, of course, the entry for a reasonable purpose. Uh, you know, it's general uh, upkeep of the property, periodic inspections, attending to the maintenance, perhaps doing the showings if you're trying to show the unit before the existing tenant vacates. Um, those things are all going to be reasonable. Um, just stopping in for one thing or another might uh, become unreasonable, and you never want the resident to kind of to reach out to the district and say, "Hey, this is this is becoming problematic." Um, and so, be mindful of those things and give the notice because odds are you know well in advance of what those plans are and why you might want to uh, pit stop in to, to see the property. Absolutely. So the only other things that we wanted to touch on fees wise there, um, there's been a lot of uh, chatter about these in the last few years. So uh, in, I believe this is 2022, I, uh, they did a cap for the, uh, the application fee that we can charge uh, per application. So $50 per person um, uh, for uh, applying for a property. Now starting January 1st, 2024, that can increase based off of the CPI index for all urban consumers. So um, that is something that can be increased just depending on what that percentage point is. Um, and that is something that can take place here in the next uh, less than a month or so. Um, the security deposit can't be more than one month's rent. Um, so make sure you are not charging one and a half, two months rent. Um, that That is something that is easily caught. Um, so you want to make sure that it is just one month. Uh, no additional pet deposits. If you are collecting the, the full month's rent, we would definitely consider a monthly pet rent that is listed um, in the application and also as part of an addendum of the lease agreement. Um, so it is uh, noted and agreed upon by, by the tenant. Um, and then the last thing is uh, the late fees are charged at 5% of the monthly rent. So uh, depending on what the rental price is, that's how much you can charge uh, and a late fee uh, on a monthly basis. So a couple of quick points we wanted to point out. Um, if there are any other updates to any other fees, we'll you know definitely consider those in, in, in another presentation. Yep. And uh, rents uh, not considered late until after the fifth. Uh, so Good many point. people will... Uh, expect those rents to come in the first of the month, and then you will pay on the first of the month, but you can't uh, implement or consider it late until well after five days past that. Um, so um, I know our, we we're working to make through this in um, about this amount of time, so uh, trying to cover as much as we could in a short period. Um, I just wanted to open it up for any questions, uh, suggestions. Oh, 
the absence of that, I have um, my contact information here for anybody that wants to reach out separately. Um, we're very happy to not only answer the calls, uh, but provide guidance. Uh, obviously, lots of people rent out properties and, and not everybody gets a lot of guidance. Um, the Office of the Tenant Advocate gives tenants a lot of guidance for free. Um, but not many landlords, especially in the District of Columbia, have the same resources. And so um, navigating what you can find online is, is certainly an option that many uh, take advantage of. Um, but at the same time, there are plenty of great property managers um, like us in the district that do this day in and day out um, and do as best we can to stay up with what DC um, may wish to impose upon us. Um, in terms of guidance, um, direction, and, and oversight. So uh, the game continues to change, and it is important to stay on top of these rules uh, because what you don't know could hurt you. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out if you need some help. Um, we're here to assist. Thank you in advance for your time. Thanks for your time, and I look forward to uh, doing more of these in the future. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.